Alright, let's use our imaginations for a moment. Imagine you're a wee little lad about six years old. Your whole world is composed of innocent cartoons and child-friendly reading material, and you're yet to possess the ability to distinguish good media from bad media. You're walking through the aisles of either the local bookstore, or maybe even the scholastic book fair your school was having. Either scenario works. You stumble across this peculiar series of comic books, or graphic novels as you're soon to learn they're called, and you decide to broaden your reading horizons by purchasing one of these books and perusing them for some light entertainment. Suddenly, before you know it, you're seeing scary demons of hell trying to eat the flesh of the cute main characters. You're seeing a scary-ass Grim Reaper-looking motherfucker murdering people. You see hundreds of innocent people being mauled and slaughtered in bloody warfare. You see a guy get cut the fuck in half? Whew. So, you're seeing a lot of things most kids probably never expected to see at that age. And most likely didn't even know they wanted to see. I say that because, for a young and impressionable kid like me, this shit was the absolute BEST THING EVER! And many years later, here we find ourselves talking about one of the greatest graphic novels of all time, Bone, the magnum opus of cartoonist Jeff Smith. A lot of fans of the Kingdom Hearts series will cite a major achievement of the games as flawlessly combining the more anime-esque elements of JRPGs with silly cartoon characters that you'd think would clash heavily with the game's narrative. Nah, get that entry-level shit out of here. Jeff Smith, the ineffable genius, did that first back in 1991 with Bone. Kingdom Hearts? More like... Uh, kingdom... lame. Say, fellas, did somebody mention the door to darkness? Let's recap some history real quick. Jeff Smith was a fellow born in West Pennsylvania and grew up in Columbus, Ohio as a lad who loved comics. Jeff grew up and attended the Ohio State University where he worked in a comic strip named Thorn, the ancestor of his eventual graphic novel series that included the origins of some of his recurring characters. After completing college, Jeff started up an independent animation studio where he did commission work for various businesses and such. But eventually, Jeff took a look at the great big clock of life and said, I am wasting the best of my time here. He then packed up and began work on his very own comic book that he and his wife self-published all by themselves. Between 1991 and 2004, 55 issues of the continuing comic Bone were released, and in the mid-2000s were collected into nine individual colored editions that allowed the series to live on and reach audiences all these years after it concluded. There were also two video games based on the comic developed by Telltale of all companies. There was a documentary made about Jeff himself and his work. There were spin-offs and anniversary releases. There was this weird freaky plush doll I found on Amazon. And here in the present day, some asshole on the internet is making a video about the series. If you can't tell, I am very excited to finally express my admiration for Bone and everything it has to offer. Although, it was a bit of a struggle to determine how I'm even going to structure this review slash analysis slash love letter slash look back on my favorite childhood story. I ultimately decided to split the video into three sections. One section to look at the general plot of the comic for anyone unfamiliar. One section to explain why Bone is really good. And then a third section just devoted to random childhood stories I have about the series because I realized that I actually have a lot of those for some reason and I thought they'd be funny to hear. As a disclaimer, please note there's going to be spoilers out the ass for both the plot summary and for the rest of the video as well because I was too lazy to put forth the effort to write a review without taking newcomers into account. Sue me. With that word of caution out of the way, let's get things started here. Bad of the bone. The story of the epic high fantasy Bone centers around three cartoonish creatures that are classified as Bones. Like, the bodily kind that I keep in my basement. I used to just think these guys were ghosts as a kid, but their racial categorization isn't important. The three Bones are all cousins named Foam Bone, the mild-mannered down-to-earth member of the trio, Phony Bone, who is a selfish, money-hungry economist who embodies the finer spirit of capitalism with his various money-making schemes, and Smiley Bone, who is dumb, but he's still the best Bone. The trio were all lost in the desert due to a recent scheme concocted by Phony that got them run out of their homeland of Boneville. After entering uncharted territory, they wind up wandering into a mysterious place only referred to as the Valley. The Valley is a place where every living thing talks, a giant red dragon just hangs around and smokes cigars, and walking wads of pubic hair known as rat creatures try to devour our hero, Foam Bone. Through a series of events, the bones all wind up entwined in the affairs of three particular dwellers of the Valley. Foam Bone meets and falls in love with a young lady named Thorn, the character I blame entirely for my unhealthy and abnormal attraction to 2D illustrations of women. It all fucking started here. Phony Bone encounters Thorn's grandmother, Grandma Ben, and is nearly violently murdered by her for calling her cow stupid. However, Foam Bone turns out to unironically be the biggest simp to ever simp 
and literally allows Grandma Ben and Thorne to use he and Phony for slave labor on their farm. Phony has none of that shit and skips off to the nearby village of Barrelhaven, where he reunites with Smiley. However, Phony finds out too late that money doesn't exist in the valley and, because he has nothing to trade for the multiple drinks he had at a bar, winds up enslaved once again in debt to the bar owner named Lucius, the greatest character in the entire series. I will explain why later on. However, it's not long before we encounter our two main antagonists, King Doc, the leader of the giant army of rat creatures, and the mysterious enemy known as the Hooded One, whose character design is a mix between the mascot used for those annual Halloween stores and M&M. The Hooded One is apparently under the orders of an unseen force known as the Lord of the Locusts, which is just a huge swarm of sentient locusts that turns out to be pure concentrated evil. Sheer terror, I know. The Lord of the Locusts are after the one who bears the star. I wonder who that could be. It's Phony. So from here on out, the Bone Cousins come under attack by multiple assaults from the rat creatures. But Foambone's newfound friend, the Great Red Dragon, manages to save them during most of these encounters. That is until Phony makes up some bullshit about how dragons have invaded the valley and plan on destroying crops or something. And all of the Barrel Haven villagers begin to hail him as the legendary Dragon Slayer. It's at this point we realize that Lucius is as angry with life as he is because he lives in a village full of retarded people. In the middle of all of this, Grandma Ben finds herself giving massive exposition dumps on all kinds of crazy lore, mostly pertaining to Thorn. Now even though this lore is very important, there is quite literally too much of it to fit into a concise and brief summary. So let me just give you the very fast sped up version. <gasps> Back when Grandma was young, the valley was ruled by the Kingdom of Athea, and a war broke out between the Kingdom and the Rat Creatures. At some point, the Rat Creatures became stronger due to a mysterious outside influence, while Grandma was busy trying to work an alliance between the humans and the dragons, the Kingdom fell and the royal family was killed. Thorne has been having dreams of the child version of herself in a chamber being guarded by dragons and it turns out this was all a memory of real events and that Grandma Ben sent her to stay with the dragons as a child to protect her from those attempting to overthrow the kingdom. Speaking of which, Thorne's parents were killed on the night she sent into hiding by King Doc and because of this the royal family falls because Thorne's parents were actually the king and queen, meaning that Grandma herself was once queen and that Thorne is the true successor to the throne of Athea and effectively the whole valley. However, now that the Lord of the Locusts is resurfacing, it spells inevitable war between everyone in the valley once again. There also happens to be a force in the valley known as the Dreaming, which is a skill shared by a special breed of warriors known as the Veniankari, who are capable of crossing between the Awakened World and the Dreaming World, sort of like Nightmare on Elm Street, but not really. As heir to the throne, Thorn is also a Veniankari, and because of this, she is a massive target of the Lord of the Locusts. The Hooded One intends to use her, Phony, or potentially both of them in a special reawakening ritual to bring the Locusts back to full power and free them from their unspecified imprisonment. Too long, didn't read? Thorn is a princess who is really good at dreaming, and apparently has the power to free the Lord of the Locusts. Phony apparently does too, but that'll eventually just turn out to be the hood one being a dumbass. Did you understand all of that? If you didn't, don't worry, because six-year-old me didn't get it either. All I knew was there were humans fighting rat monsters and there were evil grasshoppers. Back to the recap. So Phony tries to kill the Great Red Dragon, but Thorn stops him and calls out the villagers for being idiots because while they were in the mountains dragon hunting, the rat creatures burned down Barrelhaven. Afterwards, the elusive Council of Dragons decides that all of the dragons, including the Great Red One, will go into hiding thus allowing the rat creatures to freely invade the valley unopposed and cause things to get even worse. While Doomsday is happening for everyone else, Foambone and Smileybone find a baby rat creature and name him Bartleby, the best fictional pet ever created next to Appa. Phone and Smiley return Bartleby to the mountains and narrowly escape a battle with King Doc and a giant talking mountain lion named Rockjaw. The villagers from Barrelhaven ally with the remaining Veniankari warriors and together with Grandma Ben and Lucius settle a stronghold at a place called Old Man's Cave. Unfortunately, Lucius is seduced by the Hooded One, who is revealed to be the older sister of Grandma Ben, named Briar. This is a trap, of course, and results in a lot of the warriors wounded or killed. Things get worse when Phony and Thorn are both captured by Rockjaw the Mountain Lion and handed over to Briar, who finally reveals that the reason Phony is deemed the key to freeing the Locusts is because of... a giant balloon of him that accidentally floated all the way from Boneville to the valley. So it takes about 10 seconds for the enemies to realize they fucked up, and suddenly the apocalypse starts to happen as a result of the Lord of Locusts getting very pissed off at his minions' incompetence. From this point on, Bone goes from a light-hearted fantasy with some darker elements, to pretty much the berserk of children's comic books. People are dying left and right, Thorn is now carrying a big sword and is apparently marked for sacrifice by the Lord of the Locusts, and she's also really angry and edgy all the time now. The three Bones, Thorn, and Grandma Ben then begin making their way to the old royal capital of Athea, considering their side of the valley is pretty much destroyed. This journey sees them pursued by both the rat creatures as well as a revived and even stronger Briar. But thankfully their escape is made with the help of the returned Bartleby! <laughs> 
So our RPG party makes it to Athea, and a group of professional dreaming wizards explains that an uprising in the city is occurring, led by some asshole named Tarsal, who hates dragons and members of the Venyankari like Thorn, who he views as dragon worshippers. However, Thorn receives a vision from her deceased mother commanding her to seek the crown of horniness. Unfortunately, she fails to figure out what that is before Briar and her new army of both rat creatures and soldiers from the neighboring city of Pawa arrive and kill Tarsal before attacking Athea. Thorn ends up determining that the Crown of Horns is located in Tanangard, the Dragon Burial Ground. She, Foambone, and Bartleby venture to this place and, after narrowly killing King Doc, manage to touch the Sacred Crown of Horns. This ends up destroying the Lord Locusts along with Briar herself, and also unfortunately Lucius, who chose a really bad time to try and strangle her. The ancient queen of the dragons possessed by the Lord Locusts named Mim appears in an outrage, but the other dragons band together to entrap her back inside the burial ground for all of time. Thorn is subsequently named Queen, and our three PTSD-ridden Bone Friends leave the Valley of Trauma with Bartleby to return to the much less than amazing Boneville. Da end. <sighs> so, uh, I guess I should give the Cliff Notes version of all that too. Um, Bone People and Girl try to kill locusts. And rats. And the girl's really ugly relative. I promise it's way better than I'm making it out to be. Tens of thousands of locusts have invaded the valley. The grasshoppers, now in a gregarious state, are swarming agricultural lands, making pests of themselves. Locust swarms are not new in the valley. But climate scientists say erratic weather linked to climate change has created ideal conditions for the insects to surge in numbers not seen in a quarter of a century. Bone is a lot of things. It's a comedy. It's an adventure. It has elements of horror in it. Sometimes it can become so absurdly bizarre it almost feels like a parody of fantasy stories. How I always like to look at it, though, is a representation of how ordinary people like you or I would behave in an outlandish fantasy setting. Like an isekai. The three bone cousins, despite having appearances that clash heavily with all the realistic human characters, are intended to be the eyes of the audience. They all come from Boneville, a place we'd never see but from what we're told we can gather is pretty much what any ordinary town in our world would be like. The Bones, out of their element, react to all the weird and strange people and places in the valley like any rational everyman character would. Even though Phony is technically the cause of Briar's evil schemes, the three Bones are more or less forced into joining the conflict mostly contained between the inhabitants of the valley. However, they all end up contributing to the story's resolution in their own way. Foam Bone even ends up being the one to touch the Crown of Horns by forming an electricity link with Thorn, and even gets a statue of himself built. Just think, this manlit cartoon character with a big nose is going to get remembered as a god from here on out. However, despite the strong emphasis on the Bone Cousins, I mean the title of the series is Bone after all, the true main character given the most attention is Thorn. Thorn's the person we observe grow and blossom throughout the series, and her character fits perfectly in line with the traditional layout of the hero's journey. Even down to the fact that she starts off as a normal person living on a farm, but whoop, it turns out is actually the long-lost princess of the so-and-so kingdom. Okay, I know it all sounds extremely cliche, but trust me when I say there's more to it than just that. Thorne's development as a practical, sweet farm girl to a sword-wielding, bloodthirsty killer on a warpath who can also fly is quite the evolution. The world our characters inhabit also manages to develop itself extensively, which is one hell of an accomplishment for a series lasting only 55 chapters. The valley is shrouded in so much mystery, from the fact that it's nowhere to be found on all of the maps used by the bones, to the lore surrounding the dragons apparently dwelling beneath it, thus bringing up the question if the whole world functions the way it does, or if it's just exclusive to this one territory. At times it seems like the whole valley itself is just a dream world. In fact, it's totally possible to believe the whole adventure was just a hallucination the bones had while they were suffering from dehydration and heat stroke in the desert at the beginning. I mean, it... Probably wasn't since they left her home with a rare rat-like beast to prove they were there, but it's all up to interpretation. One thing I personally enjoy a lot is all the foreshadowing going on in the first two books and the subversion of expectations that come later on. For example, Bone has a tendency to introduce characters and plot devices that initially appear as insignificant or throwaway gags, but over time end up becoming more important than the reader could have possibly anticipated. In the first volume, Foam Bone retells the story of Phony getting them all run out of Boneville because the giant balloon of himself got loosed and caused a panic. This monologue seems like a simple, humorous backstory to explain how the bones end up where they are. But lo and behold, five volumes later, that balloon that was unseen and unheard of for so long is revealed to be the entire reason the current conflict is happening at all. I love that shit. It's both hilarious, unexpected, 
and it offers a logical explanation for why Phony, of all people, would be viewed by Briar as a threat to the all-powerful Lord of the Locusts. There's also the Great Red Dragon, whose first few appearances consist of him lazily sitting in roads and making jabs at the bones as if he's just a gag character, but later on we find out that same dragon is an offspring of the most powerful dragon of all time, and is also the one that protected Thorn from being killed just like her parents all those years ago. Not to mention is the only reason Foambone wasn't murdered multiple times over by the rat creatures. Another example of this downplaying of characters' importance is Lucius, who from the moment he's introduced gives the impression that he's a gag character only there to give a reason as to why Phony and Smiley have to stay in the valley. He's seen to be the generic geriatric old man who's always angry and doesn't give a shit about anyone or anything. Don't get cancer. Fuck his dog. But as the story progresses we learn about his love for Grandma Ben, and his past in the Royal Guards sworn to protect both the young Grandma Ben as well as her sister, Briar. Lucius is full of regret due to his past love affair with the evil Briar, and feels partially responsible for the fates of the royal family as well as the downfall of the original kingdom as a whole. He spends the series trying to atone for these mistakes, and cares deeply for Grandma and Thorn, to the point where he's willing to risk his life traveling on a crutch to Athea to help them. His regrets continue to haunt him for the entirety of the story, especially after he's lured into a trap by Briar and allows for the enemy to break through the defenses at Old Man's Cave. This causes the death of one of his friends named Jonathan Oakes making his rising tally of guilt go even higher. His final act is protecting Grandma Ben from Briar, the same woman he foolishly fell for years before, and in this act he dies without knowing if his contribution was even of any use. Rest in peace, angry old man. You were the most likable angry man who was ever angry and old. I think if I had to pick a favorite arc in the comic, it would probably have to be Volume 5, Rockjaw. This whole volume is essentially a side quest crammed in between the burning down of Barrelhaven and the conflict that goes down at Old Man's Cave. It's a short story containing just Smileybone and Foambone trying to get Bartleby back to his own kind in the mountains. And even though its premise is extremely simple, there's a charm and heart to it that I just adore. Since this mostly comedic arc is sandwiched between two very dramatic and serious arcs, there's this foreboding sense of dread contained within it especially with characters like Rockjaw mentioning the brewing war in the valley and the pursuit of Phony by the Hooded One. Not only that, but this little self-contained adventure is filled to the brim with lore. You have the ancient rat creature temple, you have the foreshadowing of the endgame objective of Briar awakening the possessed dragon queen Mim. It's all the tiny details layered within the whole adventure that makes it essential to the ongoing drama. And that's not exclusive to just this arc. It's like that for the entire series with little hints and nods towards things that'll eventually become way more significant than they seem, making the Rockjaw story arc a microcosm for the entirety of the Bone story. This trait of indistinctly raising more and more questions centered around the mysteries of the valley is especially prevalent in a series as dialogue heavy as this one. Sometimes there's so much dialogue that you can't really register what's important to pay attention to and what isn't, but it's far more subtle that way and allows the reader to use their special ability known as their brain to identify key bits of information, rather than having that information explicitly pointed out and spoon-fed to us. Although it definitely can go the other way around sometimes, don't get me wrong. Like most fantastical stories with all kinds of weird mysticism like dragons, magic, dreaming powers, and... Bees... Bone contains loads of elements of superstition, folklore, and the supernatural. The evil entity that is the Lord of the Locust itself is a highly enigmatic force that never receives a solid explanation for what it is and how it came to be. It reminds me a lot of Gygast, the main villain of Earthbound. It doesn't possess a real tangible form, it operates mostly through servants captivated by its evil influence, and it often appears to be more of an idea of evil itself than just a malicious big bad enemy monster thing. It's the very nature of evil itself straight out of Pandora's box, and exists as the source of unrest and disturbance within the valley. The importance of mythical folklore in Bone cannot be overstated, as there's constantly some new belief or superstition exclusive to the valley being introduced. Most of the beliefs held by the valley dwellers revolve around the dreaming, which is referred to as the hum hum by the animals on the mountain dwellers. This ambiguous power ties in with one of the more significant supernatural parts of the series, ghost circles. Ghost circles are essentially magical circles that serve as a doorway between the awakened world, or just the normal world, and the dreaming world. In the series it's established that entering a ghost circle means certain death, or at least disappearing forever. But at one point, Thorn and Foam Bone actually go inside of a ghost circle to obtain food, and only manage to survive through the Care Bear logic of holding hands. Okay, the actual explanation is that they both share a piece of the Lord of Locusts inside of them, but I like to just see it as magical friendship power. Inside of the Ghost Circle, however, are voices and apparitions of what appears to be the spirits of those who became trapped within the Ghost Circle, 
and it's these spirits that relay the message from Thorne's mother to seek the Crown of Horns. And then, once we arrive at the final battle against Briar's army, we go from the Dreaming being a mythical force that exists beyond the realm of consciousness, to the introduction of these guys called Dream Masters using it for like, spells and light monsters and shit. Imagine if a bunch of lucid dreamers suddenly weaponized their ability to make up whatever they wanted. Did I mention yet that Thorin literally flies over a mountain, and the only real comment on this is, It's just like a dream. Now, does it seem like Jeff Smith didn't have a concrete outline of this whole system of dreaming powers? Not completely, but that makes it all the more mystical if you think about it. It never tries to go full midichlorian by giving a super detailed analysis and explanation for what the dreaming is and how it's able to function. It's a power beyond comprehension. Fully understanding it would only detract from how ethereal and bizarre it is. Use your imagination if you want to give it an explanation. Maybe every time the dragons living beneath the valley take a shit, it releases some magic dream dust that floats in the atmosphere and creates some really wacky hallucinations for our characters. That already sounds way less cool. And if you want to get really insightful in all this spiritual crap, think about how so many features of our world center around beliefs, religions, and even paranoid superstitions that more often than not lead to conflicts with people of differing beliefs. The conflicts in Bones seem to strongly reflect that darker side of humanity. Just with people that wear weird hoodies and hairy rat monsters. The central appeal of Bone, and the reason I believe it's been such a captivating read for multiple generations, is the simple fact that it has something for literally everyone to enjoy. As a stupid little kid, you enjoy all the cartoon characters having an exciting adventure, along with all the brutal scenes of violence confirming that all children are actually primal hellions that thirst for blood. And as you grow older, you find more investment in the world building, the side characters you never paid much attention to, and you finally gain the ability to read the later volumes without getting nightmares from the disturbing imagery littering the pages. Thanks for that, Jeff. The fact is, anybody could pick up one of these books and become super invested in the story unfolding, which is why I was particularly motivated to make this video declaring it as a comic masterpiece. It's absolutely worth at least a skim through, even if I just gave away all the major plot points. But there's all that juicy fat left between those plot points to enjoy. The pacing of this epic story is done exceptionally well, and the nine volumes encompassing the series all managed to make a relatively short comic feel like the odyssey of graphic novels. If this shit was being published as a manga, the length would go from 9 volumes to about 36, and it would probably get an anime adaptation that added a filler arc where Phony and Smiley start up a rat creature breeding business to make money. Bottom line is, Bone offers pretty much everything you'd want from a fantasy comic. It's funny, its story is captivating, its characters are enjoyable, its world is simple yet has tons of underlying secrets, it gets spooky at plenty of moments, and it's got dragons. Go and read it now. Or later. Or not if you want, whatever, you're already watching the video. I first read this series when I was like 6 or 7, and for a good few months I was obsessed with it and carried a volume around with me all the time. I got in trouble once because my mom looked at the front cover and she thought the title was Boner. Which, I guess it is only one letter off, so I can see the confusion. I explained that it wasn't about boners and she let me off the hook. I never told her about all the killing and violence and slightly satanic symbolism though, but she probably wouldn't care. Speaking of boners, this series kind of solidified my own taste for what I look for in a fictional adventure story like this. I already mentioned Thorn being the character that doomed me to a life full of lusting over fictional creatures that will never exist. Thanks for that too, Jeff. But the series also got me interested in more graphic novels, which eventually led me to read more manga, which eventually led to me sacrificing innumerable hours of time and spending countless dollars on consumable media that never really mattered. Damn, Jeff. You really were just... out to ruin me, weren't you? Before Bone, the only things I ever read were probably Captain Underpants, and, uh, the Bible. Only the parts without the sex and violence. Bone was a true game changer for me, and the fact that it introduced me to so many elements of literary storytelling for the first time captivated me more than anything ever had. I spent hours reading all the dialogue and making up voices for each of the characters like they were actors in a play. Foam Bone sounded like Billy West, aka Fry from Futurama, Phony sounded like Angry Bill Murray, and Smiley was just Ed from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. And then Thorn just sounded like whoever I had a crush on at the time. The self-insertion levels were truly pushing the extremes. The only problem with these books was that they were really costly for a kid. And because of that, the only way to really read through them was to literally spend like three hours in the bookstore reading while making mom sit and wait for me to finish. 
I mean, come on, $11. That's like what every kid thinks their parents make in a month at that age. I have this distinctly traumatic memory in the third grade where I got a copy of Book 6, Old Man's Cave, from my school's library and didn't return it for like eight months. At the end of the year, I found out I had a fine of like $30, which was triple the cost of the book itself, and the demon of a librarian interrogated me to give back the book. I tried to lie and say I got it at the bookstore, but then she clearly pointed out those annoying library stickers all over the book. And then I lied again, saying I'd gotten it at the used bookstore, which would explain why the stickers were already there. <coughs> the stickers had my school's name on it. I swear I was not retarded. My parents banned me from buying any more books for a month. That's right, punish a child with no reading. This is peak bizarro world here. So I mentioned that the baby rat creature Bartleby is like my all-time favorite fictional creature, right? Well, back in the day when I was about 11, there was an actual baby rat that got caught in a trap my family keeps by our backyard tool shed. I decided to make the baby rat my new pet and name it after Bartleby. And I could only imagine the fun I was going to have with the our family dog snapped Bartleby's neck like a day later. You know what the funny part was? The breed of the dog was a rat terrier. Okay, I need to stop reliving childhood memories before I record myself crying. Let's swing it back to the present and take a look at the contemporary Bone fandom. During the making of this video, I tragically found out there actually exist Bone fanfictions. This one is literally just a retelling of the story, but without the artwork and visual storytelling from Jeff Smith. Great. This one is... A parody of Oops, I Did It Again by Britney Spears. I censored this one because I don't want anyone else to have to suffer the same sheer cringe attack that I had. Here's one where Phony Bone has an anxiety attack and has a bunch of dark schizophrenic thoughts. What the fuck? Here's a story where Thorne thinks about reincarnation written by a person named Gay Moonwart. You know, these are all excellent and everything, but would you believe there's zero Lemon fanfictions where the characters have intense boning sessions for us fans to fap to? Come on guys, you're not even trying! Well, as is customary with a Pico the Spicy Warlord review, I must now give this series the Rule 34 test. Let's see here. <sighs> yep, there's a few dozen reasons for mass human extinction. So Bone is a masterpiece, and I really do think it deserves the title of one of the all-time greatest graphic novels, simply due to how much it's been able to garner the attention and imaginations of people for nearly three decades now. An 11-year-old who read this when it debuted back in 1991 is now 40 years old. Jesus. Nevertheless, do not let this series status as a book aimed at a younger demographic discourage you from giving these books a read. And if you have read them, go read them again! Thanks to the age of internet thievery, you don't have to spend your lunch money on the comics like I did. You can just find versions online. This is the golden age of accessible media, people. Use your time spent in it wisely by reading more greatness like Bone. I know there's a lot more I could discuss here. And I could probably go on for like two more hours about the sequel, the prequel, the squeakquel, but I only wanted to focus on the main course of the growing Bone franchise. The story that I always wished was loved as much as it deserved to be loved. It's an absolute injustice that these books aren't given more discussion and appreciation. But hey, maybe I should be a bit more thankful the series isn't as mainstream as others like it. I mean, it's pretty much confirmed by now that popularity sucks most of the enjoyability out of... well, anything. At least I can rest easy knowing my beloved childhood comic will always remain unsullied, and un... Oh no. Oh no! OH NO! OH NO! Do you really hate Smiley's music so much? What are you, crazy? How can you stand it? At least he's over that old gray mare phase. How about... the old gray mare? My favorite! The old gray mare, she ain't what she- ah!